Welcome back to the Autoblog Podcast. I'm Greg Migliori. Joining me today is news editor Joel Stocksdale. What is up, man? Hey, how you doing? Doing well, doing well. I literally just got out of the Nissan Frontier. This is their new midsize pickup truck. I literally drove it like 25 minutes ago. Uh, and you drove one last week, probably maybe 48 hours ago. So we've got a little bit to talk about there. Staying with mid-sized trucks, really not mid-sized trucks. This is almost more like uh, kind of like almost like a compact, like crossover white space replacement thing. That's the Hyundai Santa Cruz. I drove that last week. A lot of thoughts, a little bit all over the place with it. Um, like to hear what you think. Um, so yeah, we'll have kind of a trucky review section. Staying with trucks, we'll talk about uh, the fact that it sounds like Ford is not going to do a Bronco pickup truck. Spoiler alert, I think that's probably a smart move for them. As an enthusiast, I would like it, but hey, you know, we can't have everything, I guess. I will talk a little bit of Radwood, and there is a crazy Mercedes hybrid that gives you like seven miles of range at 831 horsepower. So, you know, we're not exactly saving the planet with this car, but it sounds fast as all hell. So, Let's jump right in. You had a Frontier. We were just kind of debating off camera here what trims we each had. Why don't you tell me what you had? You probably have driven it a little bit more. And you did the first drive of the Frontier uh, way back when. So tell me your thoughts right now. Where do you think this thing ra- rates? You know, I, uh, I, I like it. I think it's a good truck. Um, and actually... Uh, I think it was Zach Palmer that was actually on the first drive, but okay. um, the, yeah, the new frontier, I think it's a pretty solid truck. I had a pro X and that's not to be confused with the pro four X. Basically this is a pro four X, but two wheel drive. Uh, so it still has all of the off-road visual bits and bobs and things. So It looks really off-roady and, you know, it's got some genuine off-road upgrades. It's got off-road shocks. It's got chunky tires. It's got fog lights and tow hooks, uh, but it doesn't get the locking rear differential or the skid plates from the Pro 4X, which is the four-wheel drive version. Um, And there's... There's a lot of things that I really like about the truck, and there are some things that could still probably use a little bit of improvement. The engine and transmission, I think, are fantastic. Uh, it's got a 310 horsepower V6, makes 281 pound-feet of torque, and it's got a nine-speed automatic transmission. They work, they work great together. The engine is really smooth and quiet, and the transmission shifts really smoothly too, and it doesn't. It doesn't have to uh, kick down a bunch of gears or go through a bunch of gears trying to get to the right one. It seems to have a pretty good idea of where it wants to be. It doesn't shift particularly fast, but it's a pickup truck. I mean, it doesn't have to be full-on sports car. And the engine, like, it feels quite... It feels potent. it it really gets around well. And even though it does have to use a decent number of revs to make its power, the fact that it's so quiet and smooth means that it doesn't, like, it's not thrashy or anything. I even got pretty decent fuel economy with it. Um, I did a drive down to Toledo and back, and on the way down, it indicated about 25 miles per gallon, and then on my drive back, I got about 28 miles per gallon. Uh, I'll admit I'm probably a bit more, I've, I've probably got more of a feather foot uh, for highway driving than a lot of people, but I, I was impressed. Uh, I also really like the steering on it. It's still the old hydraulic power steering from the old trucks, and it's really good. It's got good feedback. It's really accurate um like there there are a handful of like actual cars that could learn a lesson from this old pickup truck um body doesn't roll much uh but the downside is 
it still got a little bit of kind of the jitters and judders and stuff that you associate with kind of older body on frame pickup trucks. Other, other trucks in the segment are a little bit tighter. They don't feel quite as loosey goosey. Um, so that's one area that it can improve. Cabin is still a little bit tight also, since it is still about the smallest in the segment. Um, but the cabin is vastly improved over the old one. And I think might be my current favorite for the segment. Uh, maybe except for gladiator. Uh, all the materials are really quite nice. The infotainment is easy to use. It's got lots of easy to use buttons and knobs. Um, I was a little bit surprised that it still only had a tilt steering column <laughs> on this one. Uh, that was that was a surprisingly old school touch, but yeah, for the most part, I think the Frontier is good. I don't think I would say it's the best in segment, um, but depending on what you prioritize and what's important to you, it could be the best choice for you. Yeah, I I would agree with that. I think it's interesting in that to me, this is almost like a really close competitor for the Tacoma as far as like just like mission and how it drives and how it feels it's um you know you mentioned the ride quality it's it's a little kind of rough and ready if you will a little bouncy jouncy i was surprised how much work the steering is like that's like a real like almost like tacoma forerunner land cruiser kind of vibe and i really liked it you know i i think I would agree with you that it's also, you know, I don't think this is the best in the segment, but I do think um, it's very competitive. It's a big step forward from where they were. Um, I think it looks pretty good. Uh, it's got a little bit of like almost like a vaguely GMC Canyon vibe, except I actually think when you look at this, this looks more like the GMC Canyon to me than like the Canyon does. The Canyon's got some kind of like flares and stuff. This is just like all business, kind of blocky. Uh, so I like it. I think it looks cool. Uh, people have been noticing it in my driveway. Uh, 310 horsepower is nothing to sneeze at. They, they definitely bring some power to the fight here, and I think that's cool. Um, the 9-speed, I, like, I totally agree with you there. I, at first guess, wouldn't have thought it was a 9-speed because it is kind of a slow shifter. You're really letting things rev up, cycle down, rev up, come on back. But it's, again, it's fine and it's, it doesn't feel dated like some of the other, like the Toyota vehicles I referenced that did, that do feel a little like you're driving something from the Stone Age. Um, so that's fine. Like it feels modern or modern enough, if you will. Um, yeah. I mean, I think there's, you have a ton of options in this segment right now, like so many different things. Um, and even if you want to go a step below and look at like the Maverick or the Santa Cruz, you know, some of that might meet your use cases as well. So, I mean, just there's a ton of flavors out there right now. I think, um, you know, this is very competitive. That's, that's how I, I kind of like, you know, put a point on it. Would you, do you have a rough rating right now of the midsize truck segment, Joel? I'm curious after having driven this and probably all of them. Yeah, I think like if I was going to recommend um, a midsize pickup, it would be either this Chevy Colorado or the Ford Ranger. Um, I think all three of those are, they're, they're just, they're the best to drive and uh, have kind of the best specs and feature sets uh, I've, I specifically left off Tacoma because it, outside of its resale, uh, capability and its reputation for reliability, I, I struggle to find anything to recommend about it. I don't, it's got a really old engine and transmission that are slow and noisy. It doesn't handle particularly well. It's got an uncomfortable driving position, um, but the other three, there's a lot to like about them. Um, I think with like Frontier, if 
that would be the one I would recommend if you want something with like a really with a really nice interior and a really refined powertrain and something that has a slightly sporty feel to it. Um, I would recommend uh, Ranger if like you want a good amount of power at a but on a budget. That turbo engine is really nice. Um, it drives really well. Um, I would recommend the Colorado. Like if, well, and if you're looking for a really off-road centric vehicle, the Colorado and Ranger are great options. You've got the Tremor package on the Ranger, and you've got the Colorado ZR2 with those. Um, Colorado has great engine options. You can still get a super cheap Colorado because they still offer it with the base four cylinder and uh you can also get a diesel if you want really excellent fuel economy on the colorado like those three i think offer the most uh in the segment and honestly you just kind of pick the one that you feel most comfortable in um would be my recommendation yeah i think you definitely if you're in the market for one of these you do want to try to um, like get in the cabins because there, there's a there's differences among them uh, as far as like space, infotainment, comfort, seats. Um, the Frontier is is a little tight. I got a car seat back in there, and uh, part of me was even like, Geez, "Is this like you know? Am I supposed to even put a car seat back here? It's it's pretty cramped." But it actually he actually has this like kind of command position in the middle, so it's quite cool. Um, but I mean, I'm kind of all over the place. I feel like when you look at the probably the most consistent, the best all around trucks, you know, the Colorado really to me just does everything well. I think the interior could use a little bit of work, but still it's it's pretty good. Um, you know, a lot of times you throw the Ranger in there and when you get like the um, their off-road package, the FX4 that really gives you a nice even on road feel i really like that vibe so i kind of put those like pretty close together uh ranger interior is also a little eh, but you know again this isn't like you know seven series s class you know segment like you know there's some compromises you live with tacoma love it it's an emotional pick too many of its characteristics are from the stone age if i were going to go with like sort of an off-road like rough and ready toyota i'd be thinking uh forerunner first uh so again your average truck buyer is gonna be like well hey i want a truck maybe he's not shopping on like brand loyalty like that but that's where my process would go and then to me the gladiator is almost like its own thing it's they've made a point of saying it's not a wrangler with a bed but and it's not it's a very competitive mid-sized truck but it's definitely a Jeep. You know what I mean? So it's, that's just a different feel. Um, it's probably as the best interior in class would be my guess. The Uconnect is, is really good. There's a lot of Jeep Easter eggs. And of course it's Jeep cool. You know, you could drive that and then hark back to gladiators, scramblers from the days of yore. And you can definitely get that vibe, which is very cool, but it's also very expensive. Uh, it gets expensive quickly. Um, so there's some drawbacks there. I put the Frontier right in there with like Colorado, Ranger, I guess Canyon, just because as far as like sort of like vehicles that are real mid-sized trucks that do everything well, it don't have really any major drawbacks, you know, to really like, you know, break it down. Gladiator, Tacoma are like kind of the outliers. Then you have this like pretty strong middle of the pack. And then you throw the ridge line in there, which I almost forgot about. But to me, that's also, I would say that is like an alternative to this like middle of the pack group here, if that makes sense. Like it can also do everything you need. Very comfortable, very good interior, clever bed. But, you know, some people are not going to necessarily want that vibe. You know, it's a little, it's a little bit like a, like a pilot, you know, I mean, it's, it's pretty crossover like so uh, i guess that's my long way of breaking down the mid-sized truck segment and yeah. slicing it very much I, I think i agree with you though and and like yeah gladiator it's 
it's not one of the first things I'd recommend just because it can get really expensive and because it is uh, very closely related to the Wrangler, it comes with a lot of Wrangler drawbacks, like being really loud and maybe not handling particularly great um, things like that. It's still, if that's what you're looking for, though, because it is a very unique driving experience. I mean, that's what you're looking for. There's not really any competition. And with Ridgeline, it is very good. It does uh, most of the things that you would want out of a pickup truck. But it doesn't feel pickup trucky when you drive it. Um, the others feel like trucks. And I mean, depending on who you are, that's a plus or a, neg- um, that's a plus or a negative. I mean, some people really don't like the way dr- trucks drive, but still want a truck for uh, practical reasons. And vice versa. People like trucks because they like the way they drive. And Ridgeline doesn't drive like a truck, so they're not going to want to drive a Ridgeline. <laughs> yeah, no, well said. And that's where you can kind of put the Colorado and the Ranger in like they're good off road and on road. They feel like trucks, but they're not going to like just leave you aching when you're done driving them. Ridgeline's or not Ridgeline Frontier is a little rougher than that. I think considerably rougher than that, actually. But still, it does do a good job of being like you can drive it. You know, it feels like a truck, but you're not feeling like like you need to go get a massage after driving it. I think it 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 again fits into that middle pack of trucks that are good at being trucks, but also you know they're not the taco. Let's put it that way. So cool. Well, let's uh, segue over to trucks that are not the taco. That's the Hyundai Santa Cruz. Um, this is a you know new vehicle for this year. I was going back looking at some of the clips. You actually covered the reveal. I just drove it uh, last week, actually. Uh, out at a local drive here. Um, senior editor, West Coast, James Riswick, has driven it now, so a few of us have gotten through it. Uh, it's The way I would sum it up is it's. I feel like it's going to be kind of all or nothing. It's going to be maybe not a home run, but a really interesting thing that they can't get enough of, that consumers can't get enough of. People are going to love it. Or it's going to be a footnote because it's the answer to a question that kind of no one asked, which is, do you want this like kind of crossover thing with a pretty small bed um, that's actually sort of surprisingly quick? It's, I would, this is a cliche. Every time a new entry like this comes up, we bring it up. It's almost like an El Camino. It, uh, the stance is not particularly high, you know, it's higher than, you know, Sonata, but it's, you know, not crazy like the Frontier or something. Um, it's a little bit shorter than the other, like say a midsize truck. It does definitely, I would say, match up much more against the Maverick. And that's what Hyundai says it's, you know, looking at, um, you know, I drove the one with the turbo the turbo four so you're talking about a little bit more of a get up there than the base i think it's a 2.5 liter which is just naturally aspirated uh it it felt quick um you know again there's not much of a truck vibe to it and again that that's really not what they're going for so i don't even want to like try and like you know criticize it with faint praise or anything like that because i think it's important to kind of put it out there this isn't really a truck other than it has a bed it's a crossover with an open trunk. So at least that's how they're trying to market it. And frankly, after driving it, that's how I interpret it and would sort of agree with it. Um, but it's fun to drive. It looks cool. It looks a lot different than really, you know, almost anything out there. Um, it's one of those things where if you live in like, uh, an area where maybe you have a garage and even like the Ranger is a pretty big truck, you know, you want to have some space, you can easily back this thing in. Um, certainly it's great for like parking and like, like downtown areas where you might have to parallel park, things like that. Uh, the bed is interesting. The bed has a trunk, but it's a pretty shallow trunk. It's almost more like a cooler or a drop floor or something. So what are you going to put back there? Well, honestly, I don't know. (laughs) It seems like it's pretty good for like, you know, when, curbside takeout was like the only way you could get food it seems like it would be good for that you could pop it up and have somebody put it in there um 
you can't get a ton of stuff in there. Maybe like a duffel bag or a laptop bag. So there's that. But it's also like a nice to have feature. You can get a bunch of stuff in the bed, I think. Uh, you know, our, my short test drive was probably, oh, 60, 70, 80 miles, something like that. Obviously, I didn't really haul anything. They offer up some things like you can sort of use plywood or two by fours to make shelves for like moving things short distances. There's cleats. Um, it has a tonneau cover, which is something I love. I think that's where you get a vehicle that's very like versatile. And, you know, if you go to the store, you can't maybe load up 15 bags from Kroger in the back of your Ranger without full confidence that they're going to fly out or your Maverick, I should say. But in the Santa Cruz, you can just throw them back there, pull the tonneau cover up and away you go. So, you know, that's cool. Uh, that being said, you know, again, it's not a very big bed. So like your kayaks, you're going to have to kind of have them hanging out or on the roof or strapped down. Um, you know, it's, it's not that big of a space as far as like traditional pickup truck um, sort of footprint. Um, I think, and this is the way their, like their executives laid it out. They were basically like, if you're in the market for a crossover, come into us, check this out. You might think this is even cooler than the crossover. You're still getting some functionality and this is just the footprint that you want. It's sort of like the original mission of the Ridgeline where they were trying to pick off other crossover buyers. Um, and some people are just going to buy it as a style play because I do think it's very cool looking and I really enjoy driving it because it's powerful. Uh, it has all wheel drive. It feels quick. Uh, I suspect even the base four cylinder engine with, I want to say 191 horsepower, still going to be plenty quick. Um, so, I mean, yeah, I mean, I think this versus Maverick going to be a very, you know, could be a very competitive like face off. Maverick has the hybrid option though. Santa Cruz doesn't. They basically admitted uh, that they were caught flat-footed when they're like, oh, wait, Maverick has a hybrid. Hmm, we should probably do that because uh, Hyundai has this hybrid technology and other vehicles that they could easily put into the Santa Cruz. So they should do that. Let me just editorialize right there. That's, that's what you need. Uh, but we have been reading reports that these things are in strong demand. So, you know, maybe that's a little bit create some a uh, little bit of like a demand again here and then then bring out the hybrid. Um, so again, I know you didn't drive it, but you know, you have reported on it just high level. What, how are you feeling about the Santa Cruz? I mean, like you, I, I think it's a really cool looking truck. Uh, I like that it's swoopy and aggressive and like, it's almost as far as trucks are concerned, it's almost got a fast back roof line. Yeah. Um, and I I like the size, and I think I think if there was ever a time for tiny pickup trucks like this, I think it is now with how popular sort of the active lifestyle kind of stuff is. I mean, like I I feel like we've been told that this is a big thing for decades, going back to like even Pontiac Aztec and like Subaru Baja, but. I mean, with how popular stuff like the Subaru Crosstrek is, like this seems like the kind of vehicle that could have some real success. Because in a lot of ways, it's like you have, say, a Subaru Crosstrek buyer, and they want it because it looks kind of off-roady and active and cool, and it can carry some stuff. But uh, you may end up trying it out and realize, oh man, it's kind of a pain to throw stuff up on a roof rack or trying to wedge my uh, mountain bike in the back. And and then there's something like Santa Cruz or the Maverick where it's like, oh, I can just chuck this stuff in the bed and like a quick tie down and I'm done. Um, and then it's easy to clean out the back and stuff. So I think, I think there is a real opportunity for these to have their moment in the sun. Um, I do agree that there are some practical downsides, like something that both I think Santa Fe and Maverick are going to run into is uh, 
issues with like long loads. Um, just that short bed doesn't really give you a huge amount of flexibility. And, and I, I just keep thinking to myself that, boy, it sure would be nice if uh, either or both of these were available with the Chevy Avalanche style midgate, where you could mm-hmm. fold down the rear seats and the glass so that you could have additional space going into the cabin. Um, but that would have been, that probably would have been a lot more expensive and complicated to try and engineer. But I think they're both cool. I, I do think Maverick has a bit of an advantage coming out of the gate with a having a super efficient hybrid option and B starting at a few thousand dollars less than Santa Cruz. Um, and I think, I think that is one of the, I think the price in particular is one of the big things that Maverick has going for it because it's so cheap, like starting just a little over $20,000 that even if you weren't thinking about a truck like thing, you're thinking about a truck like thing because it gets such great fuel economy and it's so cheap. And just the fact that it's a pickup truck is a big bonus because it's like, Oh, and I get all that and I can carry a whole bunch of stuff from home Depot. Um, whereas the Santa Fe or sorry, not Santa Fe, Santa Cruz starting at a little over $25,000. That's, that's a little bit of a bigger ask for somebody that might just be looking for kind of affordable transportation. Um, and I, I do think that they should try and get a hybrid out because regular Santa Cruz fuel economy, it's fine, but it's not hugely better than like the next step up, like midsize pickup trucks. Um, and to be honest, it's base price is not too far off of like admittedly very stripped out um, midsize trucks, but still you're, you're not far away from kind of the next step up in capability. Yeah. And that's, that's a great sort of almost layer to the argument is some of the pretty stripped out trucks, like a base Colorado or base Ranger is actually quite good. So for some of the, like, like I would say maybe guys like you and me who like actually like our vehicles, maybe in their more distilled state. um, Yeah. I mean, Price and fuel economy, I think, could hurt the Santa Cruz. I also think there's some people that will buy it just because they love it, but there's also some people that are going to buy the Maverick because it's a Ford. They're going to say, oh, Ford truck? Okay, sure. Sign me up. And they're not going to even, you know, it's just Ford's been building trucks for 100 and whatever, 10 years. They're not going to like, you know, you've got some home field advantage there that just, you know, you've been in the public conscious for so long that people are going to sort of go to the Maverick for that built-in credibility and the hybrid. So, um, you know, we'll see. It's, I know the, um, the Santa Cruz is based on the Tucson platform, so that gives them a lot of flexibility. Again, the, I believe the Tucson does have that hybrid, and, you know, it just it seems like there's a lot of flexibility there. They're going to build it in the United States. Um, so, you know, it. I feel like this is going to fall somewhere between like, do you remember the SSR, the Chevy SSR, that like sort of modern day retro thing from the early 2000s? It's going to be like almost like a trivia question like that, or it's going to maybe kind of move up to be like a ridgeline type thing that sticks around, which I'm sort of of the volition that all cars are good. Choices are good. Well, not all cars are good. But vehicle choices, interesting things are good, you know. So, to me, it's a really cool thing, and I can leave it there. Um, it's up to Hyundai to sell it, you know. That's their problem. Um, but I think they've put out a compelling product. I do think there's again, there's some. I wouldn't say blind spots, but there's some like there's some holes in the full like you know go to market strategy as far as like the hybrid the price, the fuel economy, things that frankly they can kind of solve with an affordable hybrid. Um, 
and then just making this thing cool. I, I don't actually think you need to make it like a, a true rough and tough truck competitor, which it isn't. You just, you know, this is make it like the modern day Subaru Baja in a way you go. So um, I was excited to drive it. Um, I, I still think it's interesting. I think it'd be a cool long-term vehicle for us uh, as thinking out loud. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. And one last thing that I'll add, even if the Santa Cruz isn't a smash hit right out of the gate, I Hyundai has a track record of really sticking with a product um, and trying to get it right. <clears throat> Because, like, if you look at the Hyundai Veloster, it's it's had some pretty weak sales lately, and I think they are starting to finally draw it down. But they they gave the car two generations. They gave it a crazy performance version. Um, like Hyundai, Hyundai will give a product their best and give it some investment uh, to try and make it work before they just drop it all together. Um, so I think we'll at least see the Santa Cruz for a little while. And I think there are opportunities to really make it a real competitor. It, Tucson has a plug-in hybrid too. There'd be an easy way to leapfrog forward by being like, Hey, we don't have the regular hybrid, but we got plug-in. Yeah. Um, yeah. so I, no matter what, this is going to be a really interesting segment to watch the next few years. Very cool. So let's, uh, step, uh, one step. I wouldn't say down, maybe sideways. Uh, reports are the Bronco pickup is DOA. Not going to happen. Uh, to be fair, Ford never actually confirmed this in the first place. Uh, but there were, this is one of those things that were pretty wildly or widely expected, if you will. I feel like we maybe saw spy shots, correct me if I'm wrong, or maybe things we thought were this, who knows. Um, you actually did the story, you did the reporting. What, uh, why don't you break it down real quick and tell me what you think? Yeah, so <clears throat> there had been rumors for a while now that Ford was looking at making a Bronco pickup truck, and there were some real concrete things that suggested that that was the case. There was even in a teaser about Ford Bronco design, there was a drawing of a Ford Bronco with a bed and a tailgate. Um, like it was clearly something that they were considering, and with how great the Bronco reception was when it was revealed, um, I mean, it would make sense that they would have at the very least discussed, "Hey, what else can we build off of this thing?" Um, but a report came out that uh, inside Ford, they have officially canceled any further development or discussion of a Bronco pickup truck. And honestly, I think that's the right choice. There are just a variety of reasons that it probably wasn't a very good idea. I mean, one of the big ones being that right now Ford is having some real production issues with Bronco and, and not just uh, and not just computer chip issues. So they've had their whole hard top issue that they are replacing all the hard tops on Broncos and they, they don't need any other production hiccups and complications from adding another model on top of what they're already building. And I also don't think that the market for a Bronco pickup truck is quite as big as a lot of people would think. Um, for instance, like the Wrangler sells over 200,000 units a year. That's a fairly big pie that Ford can take a chunk out of with the Bronco. The Gladiator only sells in kind of the 70 to 80,000 unit range a year. And that's, that's not any more than like a Ford Ranger. And Gladiator is kind of, it's different, but it is still kind of competing with other midsize trucks. And well, Ford already has a midsize truck. And to try and steal Gladiator sales, you're only looking at about like kind of a 70,000 unit sort of pool to try and steal sales out of. I mean, it's not, it's not exactly a zero sum game, but that kind of gives you some idea of like 
okay, there's at least this many people that are considering a convertible retro pickup truck. Um, and to re-engineer the Bronco, which is related with the next generation Ranger, but to do a lot of like re-engineering and reworking and testing and making sure that it lives up to not just off-road SUV capability, but also truck capability. Because I mean, like we were discussing earlier, the Gladiator is not just a Wrangler with a bed. It's had It's got a revamped frame and it's got a lot of upgrades to make it do truck stuff on top of doing Wrangler stuff. That's a lot of development time and money and effort for what would be fairly small gains. Um, so I think it, I think it was the smart choice to be like, okay, we're not going to worry about trying to stick a bet on the Bronco for like a couple tens of thousands of sales. Just get, just get Bronco stuff, right. Maybe revisit it in a few years, maybe even a next generation Bronco. I think you sum it up really well, so I'm not going to put too fine a point on this, but I think it would have been maybe an overreach to do that because then again, you've got, what are you trying to pick off the gladiator? Well, you're, the Ranger is already doing that. Arguably a Bronco pickup might be a little better suited to do that just as far as like demeanor. But I mean, you're really starting to peel that apple back in a lot of different ways that you don't need to. Um, would it be cool for enthusiasts? Absolutely. But again, what's your like market? You know, you're talking about maybe 30 to 50,000. Let's say Ford because they could sell probably trucks that like, you know, would look like Flintstone cars. It doesn't matter. Put the blue oval on it. It's probably going to like have credibility and sell. You're still not looking at a big market case. And then you're starting to cannibalize not only the Ranger, but maybe the Bronco and maybe the Bronco Sport. So, I mean, this isn't like soft drinks where you're like, let's have a cherry Coke and a vanilla Coke and a vanilla Coke zero. And, you know, I think at some point you got to maybe chill for a little bit, for lack of a better way to say it. And then it is a very cool thing for the next generation of Bronco. You know, maybe that's like the surprise and delight after the fact thing or something. So, um, au revoir, I guess, uh, Bronco truck. We never knew you. But um, let's talk real quick about this hot rod Mercedes AMG GT. It's a hybrid that goes about seven miles on electricity, which is like golf cart range, but it has 831 horsepower. Uh, it's a beautiful car, uh, very aggressive looking, but also, you know, very beautiful. You know, it's impressive. The press shots are, you know, really draw you in. Uh, cool. I'm glad they're doing this, but this isn't like, this is definitely a performance machine that seems to have a little bit of a hybrid amplification is how I would put it. Um, yeah, that's, that's what this is. What do you think, Joel? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I am admittedly quite disappointed that the range is so pitiful. Um, I mean, seven miles, just that doesn't really get you much of anywhere. And I suspect that it's, I suspect that this is one of those cases of it has just enough electric range that it will bypass uh, congestion charges in European cities that um, charge you for driving a gas car into city limits. But because this has an electric range, it can be like, oh, no, it's it gets the exemption. Um, and I mean, it the electricity part of the car is also there for performance and it boy does it deliver performance it's 831 horsepower and 1033 pound feet of torque uh combining the electric motors and the twin turbo four liter v8 and it's just i mean that's that is an outrageous amount of torque uh, especially in a, in a, in a four-door sedan um so like I do think the performance is really cool, but I do, I don't know. I just feel like you, you really couldn't just make the battery a little bit bigger Mercedes, like get it at least to like, I don't know, 15 miles or ideally even 20 miles. Uh, I think the top end Porsche Panamera plug-in hybrids can do close to 20 miles on a charge. 
Um, <clears throat> but it's hard to fault it just for the kind of the outrageous performance. But yeah, I don't know. I, I do feel like, I don't know. It's like you, you should, you should still do a little bit better. And it's not like this is going to be a light car. This is a big four door sedan. Like they, they could have made the battery bigger and not really diminish it that much. So yeah, I don't know. I'm kind of mixed. Like the performance is, is ridiculous and I kind of love it, but I don't know if you're going to do a plug-in hybrid, it's like, he might as well try and make it a little bit more usable. Yeah. I share your disappointment with that part of it. I will say this, the GTs have been, uh, the four door GTs have been, I don't, I would almost say a pleasant surprise for me. Uh, when they sort of announced these a few years ago, I was like, well, beautiful cars, but like, where do these even fit in their lineup? You know, they already have like, you know, the, the different segments and it's like, obviously there's AMG versions of them and then several different versions of AMGs. It's like, well, what is this? But I don't know. It doesn't really fit in a neat box, but they're beautiful coupe styled sedans that are quite large. So, and they're interesting, you know, E-class, S-class, C-class, you tend to see a lot of those. GT is not so much. So um, probably because they're so expensive and powerful. But Oh, and we should also touch on the, <laughs> we were, we were joking about this on, in our office Slack channel, the, the name for this car, it's the Mercedes AMG GT 63 S E performance. Um, and there are spaces between the S and the E. They are just solo letters, just kind of hang, just kind of floating there. And <laughs> I don't know. I it feels a little bit like Mercedes needs to uh, consolidate and rework on their naming conventions. Because because like you got you got the AMG GT. And then you've got the number designating kind of like, okay, which engine it has. And then the S denotes that's the performance version of that. But then this also is the electric version. So they tacked an E onto it. So it's the performance version of this that's also electric. But it's not just, but it's also like the performance electric version of the performance version of the twin turbo V8 version of the GT. I, like they, they can consolidate this a little bit better. Like, I mean, they could have, <laughs> I don't know, they could have just called it GT63E and just, you just assume that it's there for performance as well. I don't know. It it seems a little bit excessive. When you need Cliff's notes to like, remember what the name of the car is, you know, the name's probably a little bit too long. Um, but why don't you take us back a few decades? We'll close out the show here. Radwood, you went to it uh, over in Chicago last weekend. Couple of highlights, real quick. What'd you think? It's on my list of things to do. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Um, and like Radwood canceled most of their events last year, uh, and this has kind of been their return tour. They've already had at least one show uh, out on the West Coast, and the Chicago show is kind of their one visit to uh, the Midwest. And <clears throat> it was a lot of fun. I took my uh, supercharged Miata out there. I was really shocked that my Miata was the only Miata on display. <clears throat> there were people that showed up in Miatas and parked at the parking garage, but none on like the show floor. Well, show parking lot. It was on the uh, it was on the top of a parking deck near uh, Soldier Field. Oh, cool. Um, Lots of really neat cars. Uh, not so much in the way of like kind of high end supercars, but just a lot of really just interesting stuff. You got uh, Japanese imports or Skylines. There's a neat uh, two door Mitsubishi Pajero. Um, lots, uh, lots and lots of BMWs. Um, a variety of Porsches. Uh, Let's see what other stuff. You got VWs and Honda Civics and Acura Integras. There's a really great section of custom mini trucks with like crazy paint jobs and engine swaps. And um, but it was all around a fun event. It was really hot that day. Um, not a cloud in the sky and not any breeze in the air. So it was 
it was pretty toasty, but it was a lot of fun. Lots of cool cars, nice people. Um, definitely worth checking out sometime if you have the opportunity. And uh, if you don't, definitely check out our photo gallery where uh, didn't quite get every car, but got a lot of them. and should be a pretty good taste of the event. Very cool. Very cool. Check that out. Uh, sounds like a great event. Like I said, it's on my bucket list. Uh, I think that time period for cars is really starting to kind of come back and resonate deeply with a lot of people, which is what we hope the Auto Blog Podcast does. If you enjoy the show, please leave us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. Send us your Spend My Money's at podcast at autoblog.com. Everybody be safe out there, and we'll see you next week.